Dr. Urta Zhao, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks it, for the is, it is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Melbourne. Uh, it's what morning for you there, I would imagine. It's yeah. late, late afternoon for me here in south of uh, Salt Lake City in Utah. Uh, so I appreciate you with the time difference, uh, uh, your flexibility and willingness to meet. It's an, a wonderful opportunity to, to have a nice conversation with you today. We're going to be exploring a recent study uh, that you and your team put out. And on the topic of improving gender diversity in leadership. And I like how it's framed in terms of opting out of the default. And I'll let you explain a little bit more about uh, what you mean by that here in just a moment. As we get started, I wanted to share your bio with everyone. Professor Shao obtained her PhD from George Mason University in 2006. She currently works as a professor at the Department of Economics at uh, Monash University, Australia. Her research interests pertain to the application of experimental methods to understand how incentives and social norms influence economic behavior. Prior to her association at her current university, she worked as an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University. She's also worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. What a tremendous uh, academic pedigree and background, a tremendous work that you do, anything else that you want to share about yourself or anyone from your research team uh, before we launch on into the conversation? Yeah, sure. So uh, this research that we're going to talk about is the joint work with my colleague Lata at uh, my department and uh, also uh, this one uh, from uh, University of uh, uh, Melbourne. Excellent. And we are yeah, experimental economists. Yeah, and that, that is fantastic. And uh, I, my background is, you know, I'm a, I consider myself a scholar practitioner. I'm a professional, or a, excuse me, a professor of organizational leadership, um, and my PhD is in sociology and um, international political economy. So I do a little bit with the social psychology and behavioral economics stuff myself, um, and then kind of bring that into an organizational setting. So most of uh, really what what you're focusing on in your report you know, just fits perfectly with the types of interests and framings that I often use in my own research, as well as my teaching and consulting and such. So it's really just a pleasure to be with you. All right. So as we dive on in, I wanted to uh, give you a chance to just talk a little bit about the motion, motivation behind the study. There are so many things out there, you know, in, in this, this uh, world of uh, experimental economics, behavioral economics, and all, all of the tangential related fields, so many things we can focus on. So why this? Why now? Yeah, well, diversity is a big issue and it remains to be an unsolved problems. And uh, uh, we have seen in the past several decades, uh, more and more women enter the labor force. However, uh, the proportion of women in leadership position remains disappointingly low. Um, and uh, to think about that, a precondition for women to, um, to, to in precondition for increasing the uh, proportion of women in the leadership is probably that we need more women to be willing to participate in the leadership selection process. Um, and, we have, I have to say that we have made quite a lot of effort. Lots of programs have been set up to train women to be more confident, uh, more ambitious, to be willing to negotiate uh, so-called lean-in approach. However, those programs uh, so far do not seem to be uh, access that much success. Um, individual efforts actually very often lead to backfire. I read an article from New York Times a few years ago talking about an aspiring female professor who tried to negotiate her uh, tenure track position job offer with a university. And she asked for very basic things that we usually ask, uh, such as a higher starting salary, sabbatical, or better maternity leave policy or reduction in teaching load. Um, and what the response she got from the university eventually is that they decide to withdraw the offer. So she's no longer welcome there. So this shows you that for women to get a good, good a deal as good as men, it's just, we just cannot do the same thing as men do, like negotiate like men. And sometimes it can backfire. Um, can I just uh, say Harvard, really, really quick, I, I mean, that's a super interesting example, <coughs> excuse me, 
the the backfire effect is is real in in the tightrope that women have to walk when asserting themselves, whether it's in a in a, a boardroom setting or negotiating a salary or whatever, right? We can we could lay out all these different scenarios where mm -hmm. um, where we might say you know a woman needs to assert themselves more, but the, the, mm -hmm. that is that is so challenging because. It's such a tightrope in in the nor the societal gendered norms around appropriate in and in, inappropriate behavior, <laughs> um, and and how to go about having those conversations is so so challenging. Um, I you know I can only imagine, and I can't I haven't experienced it personally myself. Um, my wife has experienced it, and it, it's just incredibly frustrating to to see mm -hmm. that occur. And we want people to be willing to be straightforward to be um, clear, direct, uh, and, and negotiate for themselves. And yet at the same time, when that happens, uh, it has these, these backfire effects and ultimately hurts the, the individual. And then it hurts the organization too, because they're, they're being dumb and, and, uh, really weeding out, uh, a whole bunch of, of really great talent. Exactly. Exactly. And that's exactly, uh, what our study trying to address. So like you said, um, it's very hard. It, first of all, it's very hard for women to change those personal traits, to act aggressively, to uh, be able to negotiate with uh, uh, their managers, for example, uh, comfortably. And second of all, even when they tried very hard after all the tra those training program, learn how to do it, they may not get really the outcome that ex they expected. Um, so a Harvard professor, Aris Bonnet, uh, she has a book called What Works and nicely said that uh, uh, those training programs simply has very limited success and in the immediate effort alone often backfire. So what we really need probably to start to think about instead of the bias individual, uh, instead of changing individuals, maybe we should think more about uh, the bias institutions. And this is how behavior economists can help by thinking taking those uh, research uh, findings that we learn, what we learn about individual behavior, try to think about whether the institutions are designed to help women to make women be able to compete and be able to negotiate. Um, so this is what our study kind of motivated by. And uh, we kind of trying to think about how can we be biased institutions. And we make a step toward uh, considering how can we de-bias institution by changing the default in the um, select leadership selection process? Yeah, um, and, and I really like uh, the focus on systems, right? So can we talk about being more effective as individuals, reducing uh, implicit biases as hiring managers, as leaders, uh, helping individuals understand how to assert themselves and be more effective. Can we do those individual level things? Sure, of course we can. But like you said, the research shows that has limited effects. Why? Because all of this is happening within, within an institution and within existing systems that have um, negatively impacted certain populations um, because they were built to support certain individuals and certain <laughs> types of populations, right? So we need to be able to disrupt those negative systems and to to rebuild them in ways that are unbiased that's easier said than done uh, but it, it sure seems like the only way we're going to see any sort of meaningful lasting change in this direction is to start to do that right exactly exactly so i think so far um we have done pretty good job in terms of uh, mentoring women like in my career uh, when I start my early career as assistant professor we attend those uh, uh, economic association uh, kind of conferences very often they have all kinds of mentoring program try to target particular at young female assistant professors or PhD students and a lot of we hear a lot of advice talking about of course we work hard um, that more they talk about uh, what do you need to do you need to organize conference you need to go approach to people you need to um, you know invite yourself to the seminars you need to basically negotiate better you need to act more aggressively basically uh, and I often wonder to what extent um, how many of us come back and really do those things that uh, you know those good advice uh, tells you to do 
um, in my own experience, I always find it very hard, uh, even though I understand those advices are all, all good, but to put it into practice, it's just very hard. Um, so yeah, so we think, okay, maybe we can do something, in, uh, you know, changing this institution. Of course, it's also a very difficult job. It's very ch challenging to change institution, especially if it's something that has been taken as a given or taken for granted, this is just how it works, right? So uh, we try to think something simple and easy to implement. And uh, that's how we uh, started to think about it. And so we focus on this as we started uh, talking about the default. To give you an example of uh, this, um, how default matters. So um, at the universities where I uh, worked with, whenever there's a opening, um, a position for a leader type of jobs, very often you got a message, an email from the head or from the university, right? They say, oh, hey, here is the, we have this leadership type of positions uh, open. Now, if you are interested in this job, please email HR or you can email your uh, department head, depending on what the job is, to express your interest. So this is kind of opt-in type of selection mechanism, right? To express your interest, you have to put your hands up. You have to go to your department head, say, I think I'm so good and I think I can compete for this job. Uh, and I noticed that uh, the outcome is often that many of my male colleagues nominate themselves and uh, we, we don't see that female colleagues. Of course, there's also less female economists. We all know there's the gender uh, in gap in, uh, in economics. So of course there's less female colleagues. So we don't know what is causing the issue, whether it's just because we don't have enough female colleagues to volunteer themselves or to nominate themselves, or it's just this kind of opt-in type of mechanism. Uh, made it easier for men to raise their hands up, but just very difficult for women to do so. And I have to confess that I never respond to any of those emails and never volunteer myself or nominate myself. Um, it, it comes back to the backfire effect, right? Because oftentimes women, even if they want to opt in, if they're viewed as overly ambitious, that's seen mm -hmm. as a negative trait. You know, exactly. it, that's a gendered perception and it's not fair, but that's a common um, bias that men would have towards a female putting themselves forward, showing that kind of ambition. Uh, and so it just it's one more example of the problem, right, of, of this system, this this simple mechanism of opting in in and of mm -hmm. itself becomes a problem and a hindrance to having parity and equity uh, in terms of women in leadership. Exactly. And also just to add on what you just said, if we view leadership as kind of stereotype men, uh, masculine type of jobs, we would think that by telling your head that me as a female, I want this job sounds like go against the norm, right? Because eventually um, most of type uh, leadership type of jobs are taken by men. By men. So um, for all this reason, and also by this, this opt-in, basically the default is that you are not considered unless you think yourself is so good, so competitive and uh, good enough to compete for this job. So you're also acting against the implicit message here to volunteer yourself. Um, and same is true, not only for leadership type of position, but also for promotion, for example, right? So in our career, when we pro want uh, to promote from assistant, to associate from associate to a um, full professor, you have to apply yourself. You have to go to your department head, head said that, oh, hey, I think I'm qualified for full professor. Um, and we also observe uh, that uh, those call for interest or call for application very often more male nominate themselves indicate interest for promotion than female. And in fact, I started to apply my <laughs> Um, uh, the, uh, apply for promotion to full professor because one day my department head walked into my office and uh, he was telling me that, hey, Ert, I think you're ready for uh, promotion. Would you like to consider to apply this year? And if you think about that, this is actually an opt-out mechanism because in that conversation, I never felt uncomfortable to say, yes, I want to apply. This is very different 
although it's sort of just very uh, subtle difference, but it's very different than if I'm, my department simply send an email widely to the uh, to the whole department saying anyone who wants to apply for promotion can tell me, right? So lead, this lead us to have this hypothesis, which is this opt-in mechanism in selection might contribute to the gender gap in leadership position. Um, and we are interested in whether we can change this by simply switch to an opt-out mechanism such that all the um, candidates who satisfy the basic criteria or the qualified candidates would be automatically considered uh, for those positions, either for promotion or for a leadership position. Uh, so yeah, so that's what we uh, want to study in this paper. We just want to test this simple hypothesis. And of course, default effect, we're not the first one who show this default effect, right? Default effect has been shown a powerful in changing behavior in so many domains, such as uh, organ donation and promoting more people to save or taking up insurance. What we want to do in this paper, and we don't, we're not aware of that many studies showing uh, this gender difference in the default effect, and we want to apply this to the leadership uh, competition process or selection process. We want to see whether by switching from an opt-in mechanism to opt-out mechanism, this default effect would have a greater impact on women's willingness to participate in the competition for leadership position uh, as compared to men. Yeah, excellent. And that's a great setup um, for how the study uh, was designed and what your motivation and your main kind of questions were as you were uh, approaching this. So tell us a little bit about your what, what you found and what uh, your main conclusions were. Yeah, so um, as I uh, mentioned that we are all experimental economists, we are trying to uh, draw causality that the opt-in mechanism is one of the reasons to lead to the, the gender gap in leadership. This is, of course, very hard to do in the field because you basically, if you want to know the causality, you need to have basically two institutions that are identical, except one use opt-in mechanism to select leaders and the other use the opt-out mechanisms to select leaders. This is probably not impossible to do that in the field. So what we do is to uh, use experimental methods. We conduct uh, laboratory experiments where we create decision environment that simulate a similar decision environment in the field where people have to consider whether they want to compete for leadership position. And then we simply just change one variable, which is opting or opt out. So we conduct uh, uh, experiments where um, People, for participants, first just work on some real effort tasks. And then after they finish, we tell them that there's a second part of experiment where we're going to select a leader. Uh, and uh, your group, uh, each group will still work on the real effort tasks, but the money will go to the charity. The job for the leader is simply to make a suggestion to the group how many tasks they each of them should, um, should work on. And this is non-binding. So the leadership position that we are considering here is sort of like a advice given type of leaders. You can think about this as uh, community leaders, or in, I, I should say that in our department, for example, also the leaders is often the role is to coordinate, right, to give suggestions to the group what they should do. So it's not really very high power uh, type of leadership. But uh, we do that because we just want to have a very simple environment uh, to draw the inference about the effect of uh, opt-out. And then we uh, create two conditions. In one condition, participants were told that they, um, they if they want to participate, if they want to uh, compete for the job, they have to select uh, yes, I want to compete for the leadership position. So they have to explicitly express their uh, desire that they want to compete for the job. In another condition, opt-out condition, we tell them that the every group members will be automatically considered for this position based on their previous performance. However, if they wish uh, not to compete, they can opt out. So they can uncheck the box. Uh, says, yes, I will compete, and instead select the option that, no, I do not want to compete. So that's it. 
And then we just look at how many people uh, compete for this, uh, choose to compete for the leadership position in these two environment. And in particular, of course, we want to see whether there's a, a gender difference in the participation rates. And what we find is that in the opt-in condition, about on average, about 80% uh, men decide to compete for the position, but only 50% women uh, decide to compete for that position. But once we change the, the framing of the question from to opt out uh, condition, the gender gap almost disappear. So 90% uh, of men compete. So we see this increase of participation for both men and women, but the proportion of women to, who are willing to compete increased to 80%. And there's no statistical difference between men and women in this condition. So basically we close the gap. Um, in the opt-out condition. Yeah, and that, just to, to reiterate, I mean, that's an incredible shift just by one minor little change, right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and instead of having an opt-in and having an opt-out, this minor little change made all the difference in the world in, in closing that gap. Uh, mm -hmm. And now imagine if one little change like that can make that kind of a difference. Imagine if we start to look holistically and systemically across organizations, all the little policies, practices, procedures <laughs> that occur yep. that disproportionately uh, privilege men over women. And mm -hmm. we start to dismantle those things. All of a sudden, it seems reasonable to think that we could get to the place where we could have um, gender equity in the workplace. Uh, now that's easier said than done to, to mm -hmm. actually uh, be willing to, to challenge our assumptions, challenge tradition and to shift and make those adjustments. Uh, but I, I think sometimes this seems like an impossible task and what you're demonstrating is it's not impossible. We can do this. Exactly, exactly. So uh, yeah, we probably will we'll talk about in practice, uh, what might be the challenges later. Uh, but let me just highlight another thing, just follow what you just said. One result I found particularly interesting is that we also ask participants to indicate whether they want to compete for the job or not, if they know that they're best performer. So that means if they just say, yes, I want to compete, they will for sure win the position. And what we observe is that under the opt in condition, we still, there is still gender gap, more significantly higher proportion of uh, uh, men say they will uh, participate or they will compete uh, as compared to women. But when we switch to opt out condition, again, we do not see any gender difference. In fact, we get 90% of participants, both for men and women, decide to participate. So this tells us those training program, right, by just telling women to act aggressively or train to improve their qualification will still not work that well under the opt-in mechanism. Um, even if women know that if they're just willing to compete, they will for sure win the competition. Still, there's just something about the women. Maybe it's about this not want to show aggressiveness, not want to show this assertiveness or not want to show ambitious, this all go against the stereotype of women, just all this barrier created, we can now remove those barriers by just a switching from opt out, uh, opt in to opt out. Um, it, yeah, excellent. And we're getting close to the end of our time uh, today, but I wanted to give you a chance to share a few of the caveats and the challenges that this poses for organizations and what uh, organizations might be able to do, practically speaking, to, to start to implement, you know, utilize this finding to make some changes? Yeah, so we actually had some conversation with some organizations about doing this. First of all, I think this mechanism works very well if the organization wants to promote their uh, internal candidates to the uh, leadership position because you can lay out those criteria cl uh, clearly and you know your employees very well. So you kind of know who are qualified as long as they're willing to put their hands up who are qualified for those positions. So all what we need to do, to, need to do is simply to identify those candidates based on those minimum criteria and then simply tell uh, you send an email or uh, go to talk to your employee it says that uh, we want we would like or invite them to compete, right? So by inviting is also setting up, up a default that you are considered, you're very welcome to compete as long as you wish to. Um, so I think that can be easily done in, in some organizations. Now, some 
type of leadership position, you might also want to consider external candidates. Those are the situation might be a little bit difficult because you, sometimes it's very hard to identify who are the external candidates. But if there is such case where if there's some specific type of leadership position where only very limited number of people on the market are available for you to consider, I think that still uh, can be uh, considered. And I think all what we need here is a simple invitation message to the potential candidates that you think they're qualified. Um, and sometimes I'm, I'm actually surprised that uh, this has not been considered. Maybe people just have not really think about the default or the implicit message underlying the selection mechanism. Maybe we are all just thinking that, uh, you know, the recruit message is always you send out an advertisement and then you always assume that as long as people are interested, they would just nominate themselves. They would just submit the application. But um, if I, we understand the psychological mechanism underneath that, if we understand, if we consider the norm behind that, it's probably not as straightforward as we would have thought. So I think it's very important for organizations simply just to think about what is the implicit, what is the default message underneath their selection mechanism. And in fact, our uh, universities, Australia, which is the association uh, of Austra uh, universities in uh, here, they have just recently advertised our opt-out mechanism in their uh, best practice recruitment guidelines as a potential solution to encourage internal candidates to apply for leadership position. And this is not just to reduce the gender gap. We can, I think this in general, just increase diversity of the, um, Exactly, and not just um, gender, but also ethnicity. We want more minority participate in certain type of job. Maybe we should all think about this uh, difference between opting and opt out uh, mechanism. Awesome. This has just been a real fascinating conversation. I really appreciate you laying out this study and all of the research behind this. I uh, appreciate the insights that you shared and the practicality of all this and, and the reality that this is doable. Like we can make changes that can erase the gender gap and provide equity and parity, not just for gender, but like you said, uh, really for uh, all uh, different populations that everyone, we can truly have a diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging within our, our institution, our organization, and, and drive the value from that. Uh, it has been a pleasure talking with you. Before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you and your team, find out more about your work, your research, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Yeah, uh, very nice talking to you. And I'm very glad to share this research with you. And I think there's uh, lots of research still need to be conducted uh, in terms of finding out how this uh, mechanism works. And our team are very interested in, in this uh, gender diversity issues. And we would like to apply uh, those behavior insights into changing the institutions, thinking about how to design the mechanisms. Uh, and I would also want to advertise this experimental research uh, as a methodology is a very good way to think about to really understanding the mechanism underneath that. And uh, it's very nice to think about this collaborating with organizations, something you just cannot easily do in organization. You can have a child in the lab and uh, doing some experiment to find out whether a certain mechanism would work or not. Uh, and our research is exactly for that purpose. We, try, we can pretest some mechanism to understand it before you really put into the real world to have really in, real impact. Uh, so yeah, very nice talking to you. And uh, I hope more uh, listeners would uh, try to start to think about uh, the message uh, that they're sending when they think about how to design the mechanisms. Wonderful, thank you so much. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about the research, find out more about uh, the team and the work that's being done in this space. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.